The last two years have seen unprecedented developments for both the economy and capital markets around the world, but it seems like some of these forces are shifting now. What are these forces and what can we look forward to in 2023 and perhaps beyond? Sam Burns is the chief strategist at Mill Street Research, a macroeconomics top-down research firm. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hi, David. Thanks very much. Um, coming from an independent macro research uh, background myself, I have a lot of respect for the kind of work that you do and uh, the kind of research that you've, uh, you're have you doing now. So we're going to be talking about some of your research. Uh, one of the major themes of your research today is the decelerating inflation rate that we've seen that you told me offline may persist. So uh, let's back up and talk a little bit about history before you're giving your forecast. We've seen inflation, headline inflation in the United States peak at 9.1% in June, and it's been steadily coming down since. I've heard all sorts of theories as to why inflation has been decelerating for the better half of the last year. What's your take? Why has inflation come down? Oh, no, you're right. Uh, I think that uh, it's an important point that the inflation rate did peak, I think, around June, July of last year, and uh, it's really been decelerating across a lot of different measures. And I think that reflects the fact that most of the inflation that we've seen over the last couple of years was due to these ex extraordinary shocks. Uh, the COVID, the response to COVID in terms of stimulus, and then uh, you know more recently Russia, uh, you know disrupting the energy markets, and then you know China's uh, you know uh, response to COVID more recently. Those are all big shocks to uh, the economic you know uh, backdrop and inflation in particular. And it's been a long time since we've seen this kind of volatility in uh, the economic data and inflation. I think that's confused a lot of people and even including up to the Fed um, and because we're not used to seeing things change this rapidly. So I think we had a very rapid acceleration in the first half of the year last year and a very rapid deceleration once it looked like the uh, uh, energy prices uh, stopped going up. We had oil prices really, you know, and commodity prices in general come down starting around June and, and continuing even through today. Uh, I think that was the first real, you know, clear measure uh, in real time that, that inflation pressures were weakening. Um, and then I think the, the, the cumulative effects of the Fed's hikes, uh, which really only started around mid-year last year, uh, are showing up in the data right now. So I think those two things together are, uh, are, are what's driving inflation lower. And I think barring any bigger surprises, I think that's going to continue. Okay. If one were to assume that uh, Fed tightening has been one of the drivers of lower inflation, um, and if one were to also assume that uh, the Fed is becoming less hawkish, can you make the statement or assumption also that uh, inflation will at some point stabilize this year? Perhaps not go down all the way back to 2%, but stop decelerating and stop growing to stabilize? I think I think it certainly is likely that that be the case. Um, I think, you know, right now, even if you look at the last six months, uh, annualized, the inflation rate is already at 2%. Uh, and some of the other measures are, are, are that or lower. So I think, you know, more likely, yeah, you'll, you'll get inflation, the year over year numbers, which of course is what the Fed and a lot of the headlines focus on, uh, will come back down closer to 2%, um, you know, as we get closer to mid-year and those numbers from last year kind of roll out of the calculation. Uh, so I think the, the cumulative effects of the Fed's tightening are going to still be felt and continue to put downward pressure on inflation. We're seeing that in housing already. You're seeing it in you know the used car market. Um, a lot of the, the good side of the economy is already seeing much lower inflation, if not deflation. And it's really only the services side of the economy where we're seeing uh, that kind of persistent inflation caused by uh, by labor costs. I think that too will ease as we get later into the year. Okay. Um, it's quite often, well, not often, but throughout history, we've sometimes seen inflation coincide with higher growth. Um, these two variables have sometimes been correlated, positively correlated. That didn't seem to be the case in 2021, uh, was it now, Sam? Uh, wh why is that? Yeah, no, 2021 was was very much a uh, an unusual you know, year because it was so affected by uh, COVID and the stimulus response to COVID. So that you had, uh, you know, the, the government essentially giving people more money to spend, but they didn't necessarily have a place to spend it all, all the time. And so you had very distorted readings on both growth and inflation. Um, and then the Fed kind of only came along later to really you know, respond to that. And normally, if growth were very high, as it was in 21, the Fed would have started raising rates you know, earlier. Uh, but because of all the distortions from COVID and everything else, it was unclear what was really going on. And so they were you know, kind of later to start raising rates than they would have been normally. So you had both 
COVID itself, the fiscal and monetary responses to COVID, and then the lag effects of that on the response to uh, the inflation and growth data that came through you know, last year that have all skewed the normal relationships that you would see between growth and inflation and policy. Um, so I think as we kind of go along into this year and next year, we'll probably get back to something closer to kind of the normal relationship. And that's why I think the market is pricing in maybe the Fed stopping the rate hikes and even cutting rates either late this year or next year, uh, because you'll start to see uh, the response to slower growth uh, coming through in Fed policy. Now, this slower growth you're talking about, is this a response to uh, Fed policy or is this just a coincident indicator? In other words, suppose the Fed were not tightening right now or uh, into the future, will we, sl will we still get slower growth worldwide? I think so, at least slower relative to what we saw in 21 and 22. Uh, which were, you know, just extremely high. So, you know, going from a very high rate of growth that was sort of unsustainable down to a slower rate of growth feels, you know, like a big slowdown, uh, even if in, in in actual terms it's not as much. Um, but I think you do have things uh, that are going to bring growth back down to kind of more historically normal levels, um, both in terms of whether the even if the Fed were not raising rates, I think you would see a slowdown. Um, partly because the fiscal stimulus, which was a big driver of the growth we saw the last couple of years, has slowed down pretty dramatically. All that the stimulus checks and all the other programs that were put into place after COVID, mm -hmm. most of those have expired or are, are winding down. Um, there are still some some effects of you know things like the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and things like that in the U.S. that will will you know produce a bit of um, you know fiscal support for a little while longer. But generally speaking, those stimulus drivers that were there for several years now are really fading. And uh, I think that's going to bring back, you know, growth back down to closer to sort of what the, the normal rate of growth would be given you know, demographics and, uh, you know, technology and you know, productivity and things like that. So I think we're going to get back closer to what we had kind of pre COVID over the next couple of years, particularly since, you know, there's not a lot of other growth drivers, you know, outside the U S mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to rely on. I don't think China is going to be a big growth driver, now, Europe may avoid a recession, but it's not going to be a big growth driver. So I think there's there's not much to drive uh, growth and inflation higher looking forward. And just to clarify here, you're talking about slower growth, not negative growth, right? We're still in expansion, just at a slower pace. We are right now. That's true. Yeah, I think we're at sort of a, a slower pace of growth now. Um, I think we might, you know, you could see negative growth uh, over the next you know year or so uh, show up in some of the data. And certainly, possibly in, in earnings data, but I think um, if there is a recession, it would be a mild one relative to you know past experience. Um, I think some of that is because the economy is better able to withstand the Fed's rate hikes now than maybe it was say in the 05, 06, 07 period when there was a lot more leverage in the system, a lot more sensitivity to rates. Uh, I think there's a bit less of that now, at least in the U.S. Now maybe other other countries, other markets, that's maybe less the case. Uh, even in in places like Canada. Uh, there might be more sensitivity, but uh, I think in the U.S., uh, the the lagged effects of the stimulus and the uh, balance sheets and things are better positioned now to withstand that, and so you, you get a slowdown, maybe marginally ne negative growth, but not a, a severe recession uh, like like maybe some people are talking about. Not a severe recession, but a marginal uh, decline. Uh, what, what, would you would you be comfortable placing a rough probability on this decline? Like, to, if you were to if you were to define a recession as two quarters of consecutive negative GDP growth, which we had briefly last year, what is the probability of that happening again on a more sustained basis? Um, so I think that would be a possibility if you look out, say, over the next 18 months. Um, I don't think the, the, this current quarter or the next quarter would probably see that. Um, so I'm not looking for that near term. But over the next, say, you know, year, year and a half, maybe two years, you could definitely see uh, you know, two quarters of negative growth, uh, but I don't think they're going to be uh, heavily negative. I don't. I don't think it's going to be a, a severe recession uh, like we've seen. You know, in some cases in the past, I think it'll be sort of a more you know mild response. And I think the Fed will then respond to that by by cutting rates and helping to offset you know uh, the the effects of, of slowing growth as we get later in this year and early next year. So I think some of their hawkish rhetoric right now is going to change over the next say you know six months or so. And I think that will help 
uh, mm-hmm. the bond market respond, and then the, the economy avoid what would have been maybe a, a more severe recession. But why not a severe recession? Just to challenge uh, your thesis a little bit here, uh, Sam, uh, two of the arguments I've heard is that uh, first, you, you have an asset bubble that is perhaps the worst on record. Part of that has already popped, but a lot of people have told me that the bottom is not in yet. That's going to severely not impact not just capital markets, but cause a ripple, ripple effect throughout the economy. The second point of interest is, of course, interest rates themselves have gone up. That's affected not just uh, corporate balance sheets, but also consumer uh, discretionary spending. Uh, the higher your mortgage, the higher your credit card debt, uh, interest payments, uh, the lower your spending on the economy. And of course, we have seen credit card uh, balances pile up. Uh, despite uh, everything else we've discussed, these are not great-looking indicators. Um, and in fact, if you look at the um, if you look at history, uh, we haven't really seen mortgage rates this high for 20 years. We haven't seen interest rates rise this quickly for quite some time. I uh, know you're right, and I think uh, some of those factors you mentioned, uh, particularly interest rates, are the reason why we're seeing the slowing growth uh, that we'll probably see this year. Um, I think there are you know a few things that might help balance out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, the the asset uh, bubble um, kind of influence is probably less now because a lot of the the assets that were the most uh, kind of, you know, bubble looking have really, you know, been deflated. Um, I think kind of the, 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 the real uh, economy uh, kind of assets um, are not as inflated uh, right now. I don't think there's a lot more downside in terms of you know equity prices and, and asset prices in general, uh, relative to where we were, say in October of last year, um, not to say that stock markets are going to go straight up, but that um, that that there's going to be there won't be the same um, kind of negative asset impact as maybe we saw after the year in 2000 bubble, the tech bubble popped in uh, you know 2001, 2002. Uh, I think that was a more extreme uh, kind of bubble type peak than we saw this past year. Um, and in terms of you know what's going to prevent a more severe recession, I think some of it is the fact that interest rates, and particularly the long end of the yield curve, has already come down some. We've already started to see mortgage rates come down a bit, uh, and that's helped you know, some of the uh, uh, housing market indicators improve a little bit, and the housing stocks have improved. Um, and I think there's still some pent up demand um, from you know, consumers and companies uh, that's that's still there, and that will will provide a bit of momentum going into this year. And I think the fact that the labor market is still fairly tight, um, you know, people are able to find jobs and, and get wages, uh, even if maybe at a somewhat slower pace, uh, will provide the spending necessary to you know keep the economy from from falling off a cliff. So I think it's going to be a balance between whether the you know the Fed will overreact to the labor market and try to over tighten, um, or you know kind of halt and, and maybe ease a little bit as the year goes on. Uh, and that's really the risk is, is policy risk, I think, more than anything else. Uh, but I think uh, there's enough momentum coming into this year to avoid you know, kind of the wor- that worst case scenario. And I think there's, uh, uh, you know, at least a chance that the, that the policymakers will do what they need to do to prevent uh, the worst case uh, coming through uh, in real terms. OK, now I'm, let's talk about the labor market briefly here. Uh, in all prior recessions that I'm looking at, the unemployment rate has spiked at least one percent throughout the course of that recession, um, whichever period, time period that may be. In the last one that we had, uh, not not the minor blip in 2020, uh, the last one that we had in 2008, the unemployment rose to 10% in the U.S. How likely can we see that again? My guess is that that level of, of unemployment is probably unlikely. Uh, the 2008 period was was unusual in a lot of ways, um, and I think you know really provoked an extreme response, particularly coming after a long stretch of, you know, potentially unsustainable growth, I would say, um, in the years leading up to that. And the, the sort of, uh, you know, weakness in the financial system that was related to a lot of uh, the, the economic weakness and the fact that the uh, the fiscal response to it was much weaker than arguably it should have been. Um, I think the response to COVID shows that there is scope to do more, uh, both from a fiscal and monetary standpoint than we did uh, in 2008 to prevent that sort of outcome. And I think that the um, you know the, the drivers of it are, are not there in the sense that um, there's not likely to be the oversupply of labor now that there was potentially even back then. So um, you know anything can you know could, could happen. I think it's certainly possible that the you know, unemployment rate does rise, 
But I would be shocked to see, you know, that kind of, you know, nine, 10 percent unemployment rate anytime, you know, in the next, say, 12 to 18 months, uh, like we saw then. I think the uh, the fiscal backdrop and the uh, the kind of cyclical backdrop that we're coming out of uh, are not the same uh, as we saw then and, and probably don't support that. OK, well, in terms of how your thesis affects capital markets and assets overall, uh, which sectors of Let's start with stocks first. Let's let's cover stocks. Which stock? Uh, which sectors of the stock market do you think will likely perform the best this year? Yeah, so I'm looking at uh, more of you know coming to some of the cyclical areas. Uh, so parts of the financials, industrials, um, energy has been of course doing well for a, a quite a while now and still has you know, some tailwinds, but I'm, I'm a little less enthusiastic about it uh, looking forward. I think you know, energy prices and, and a lot of commodity prices are probably going to be you know, maybe stable or lower, but probably not a lot higher. Um, and then even some of the consumer areas, I think, are, have some uh, appeal. Uh, because again, I think relative to where expectations have been, uh, they may actually turn out less bad or, or better than expected. So I think a lot of what uh, is, is, is important for looking at markets right now is where are expectations likely to go uh, or, you know, be, evolve relative to where they were over the last year, or even the last few months. I think a lot of people got very negative, very pessimistic about equities in general and about the, the, the economic outlook and uh, have uh, you know been very negative about earnings. I think some of that will be less bad than expected. We're even starting to see that in, even in Europe. Um, so I think uh, some of the more cyclical areas of the economy are, will probably hold up relatively well. Uh, I think some of those defensive areas like utilities um, you know, and, and areas like real estate, commercial real estate, are probably going to... Uh, you know, still, you know, underperform. I think it's going to be a hard time for them to really, um, you know, hold up well on a relative basis versus uh, some of those other areas. The, the tech and growth areas uh, are very mixed. They've been under a lot of pressure, um, but there are signs that that's starting to get a little less uh, less bad, certainly for some of the areas outside of the very mega cap uh, kind of technology names that have gotten most of the attention. Um, so there is some signs that there may be stabilization there. Um, so I think overall, it's really a matter of where are things better than expectations, where were expectations very negative. And I think there are some of those areas, there, there are cyclical areas that uh, are looking better than they, they used to. And that's where you'll see the, the stock prices respond. It's interesting. I think the first question that came to my mind when I'm listening to you is why you're going into cyclicals per se uh, during a period of economic slowdown. No, that's right. I think it's it's somewhat counterintuitive yeah. um, because there's uh you know the assumption that if things are slowing down, you want to go into defensive areas yeah. um, that are you know lower beta, less exposed. Um, and there's, there's there shouldn't be going to be some some of that. You know, consumer staples are actually looking uh, looking okay now. But I think um, a lot of it has to do with you know again slowing down from a very high rate of growth to a more moderate rate of growth is different than going from moderate to to recession. Right. And I think again. Because the uh, investor sentiment had gotten so negative and pessimistic, you know, late last year, that it doesn't take a lot of uh, upside, you know, surprise, uh, kind of, it doesn't take much good news to allow stocks to respond favorably um, relative to, you know, what was expected a few months ago. And then things like financials, you know, if if anyone's going to benefit from higher interest rates and wider, you know, lending spreads, it's going to be the banks. And if markets do a bit better, then you know those those areas can have some tailwinds to their fundamentals. Um, certainly, transportation areas are going to benefit from the pent up demand for for travel and things like that, and lower fuel prices. So there, there and even the reopening uh, of China will help some of the you know, commodity makers um, as well as travel um, and even some luxury goods makers potentially. So there are definitely offsets um, within the U.S. and globally that might help offset. Um, some of the effects of, of higher rates and, and slowing growth in, in aggregate. Okay. And finally, uh, which asset classes outside of equities do you like and dislike? Um, I mean, equities is probably my favorite right now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still underweight uh, bonds. Uh, Longer term bonds, I think, have already kind of priced in some of that uh, slowing growth and, and, and you know, Fed, um, you know, kind of change in policy, you know, maybe later this year. So I don't know that there's much more upside to the long end of the curve. I would stay on the short end of, of the U.S. yield curve. Uh, I do like equities outside of the U.S. better than I like U.S. equities uh, and have for a little while, in particular in Europe, where, again, that idea of things being less bad than anticipated uh, is really playing out right now. I think that might continue for a while longer. Um, I'm not especially strong on commodities, except maybe as a weak dollar play. Um, I think commodities in general probably be 
you know, under pressure just from the slowing rate of growth, except for the uh, the China specific ones where, you know, things like copper uh, are, are really seeing a big boost right now. Um, so I think uh, if you want to play that, you have to be very specific about which uh, commodities you, you want to want to play in. Mm -hmm. Things related to building and, and copper like that uh, are potentially uh, areas to look at. Um, but otherwise, I think uh, I think you know, equities in general um, are going to probably be the place to be for at least the next few months. All right. Perfect. Sam, thank you very much for spending the time to, to explain your thesis and to educate our audience. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to subscribe.